cash flow is king. So I can have a business and the business could be making no money, but I could have tons of cash flow. What has gotten you here will not get you here. You have to change what you're doing. You will hit a ceiling and you need to take the ceiling and make it the floor. Sales, sales is the most important thing and you want to bring money in the door, but you don't want to do a sale just to sell. You need to have the proper profit margin. You need to know how to value your service that you're selling. As a business owner, the biggest thing that sucks is that you cannot talk to anybody about your problems. Thank you for watching the Real Estate Doctor podcast. If you get value from this episode, which I know you will, please hit the subscribe button, like it, comment, do your thing. Hey guys, welcome to the Real Estate Doctors Podcast. Today we are going to educate, inspire, and entertain you. Today, maybe I will inspire you and educate you. Uh, you know, this is part two of the business coaching, and I decided I'm going to call this the real deal business. So this is for all you self-employed, and, and I'll redefine self-employed or business owners out there. And this is coming from the heart, this, this podcast. So let me just define again, um, you know, the four quadrants that Robert, Robert Kiyosaki talks about, the cash flow quadrants, which is employee, well, we'll start down here, yeah, employee, self-employed, that's where basically you own your own job, business owner, where you have people working for you, and then investor, where your money works for you. We're all striving to be investors. Now, I'm talking here to the self-employed and business owners, and I'm going to start with one right off, the, the most important thing. As a business owner, the biggest thing that sucks is that you cannot talk to anybody about your problems. You know, why can't you talk to anybody about your problems? Because your problems are like this. I don't know how I'm going to make payroll this Friday. Well, who are you going to tell? One of your employees? Um, I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. You know, I might be able to get the business through, but there's no money left for me. And how am I going to pay the bills at my home uh, this month? Well, who are you going to tell that to? Your wife or husband? You know, just going to cause more stress. And what happens to us business owners is we don't, get good advice because we are afraid. And listen, I'm not telling you that you should start advertising to your competitors that, hey, I don't know how I'm going to make payroll this Friday, and I don't know how uh, we're going to pay the bills this month. But at any point in most businesses, whether you're a startup business and you're borrowing money to get going, whether you are a business, a small business, and you got too big too fast and the cash is not coming in, a lot of times this does not mean that your business is not doing well. And as I spoke about on the previous podcast, it's important that you're looking at your financial statements because you will know, does this mean that this business is broken and it doesn't work and I need to make tough decisions, which are hard to do? Or is this that, you know, I've done the work, people owe me money and I'm waiting to collect it and I'm in a cash crunch which happens to every business. So when I say that you can't make payroll, that doesn't mean like, hey, your business sucks. You know, that just happens. You know, you're trying to do the right thing. You pay all the bills and guess what? One of your biggest customers doesn't pay you or they're late or your customer's the government and they love to pay like 90, 120 days later. So the biggest thing that sucks is you can't talk to anybody. That's why you need a business coach, you know, because a business coach is not going to judge you. They know what the deal is. Like for me, I know. You know, maybe you need a colleague that's a friend. You want somebody that knows what it's like, but isn't going to take like solace in the fact that, oh man, that sucks, you know, or it isn't going to hurt you that you tell them some of your weaker points. And one of the things that, you know, in particular that sucks about being a man or a head of a household, and I'm not saying that some women aren't the head of household because they certainly are, is that, you know, you got to be strong. I remember. I had some salespeople and, and I would tell them like, you know, I would tell one salesperson, you know, hey, if we don't sell some stuff this week, you know, I'm not going to be able to pay payroll. And, you know, that person would like kind of coil up and not be able to do anything. 
All they're thinking about is, oh my God, I'm not going to get paid on Friday. I don't know what to do. And then I would tell it to a different type of salesperson. I'd say, listen, if we don't sell some stuff, we're not going to make payroll this. And that person would sell like a madman. You're dealing with all types of different personalities and you can't convey what the situation is. You know, you could be super scared, but you have to show confidence, you know, but all of the problems that you deal with in business, and I'm talking directly to other business owners, you know, we all deal with, you know, this is not like unique to you. I used to wonder like, you know, hey, how come everything is so hard for me, but for Johnny, everything's perfect. Well, for Johnny, everything isn't perfect. He's just not advertising to the world that he's having problems too. And if we all actually collaborated and helped each other, maybe we would all get through them simpler. But what I want to tell you is, let's talk about, you know, uh, hard decisions that you have to make in business. First off, I talked a little bit about, you know, last week, you know, in the last pod, you know, it's very important, you know, sales, sales is the most important thing. And you want to bring money in the door, but you don't want to do a sale just to sell. You need to have the proper profit margin. You need to know how to value your widget that you're selling or value your service that you're selling. And value to me, especially, you know, as I've gotten older, does not mean I sit back and I think about, well, do I think that John will think that's affordable? I don't care if John thinks it's affordable. This is my price. I'm going to give the premium product. And if you want the premium product or service, this is my price. And if you can't pay it, that's nothing against me. You just can't afford it. I can tell you that if I was selling uh, a service, let's say for $50,000, and somebody negotiated me to $25,000, I could not provide the same service at $25,000, but the expectation of my customer would be that I give them the same best service for that twenty five. dollars So value yourself. Figure out if you're going to do sell a widget, sell a service, what is the right price, the right profit margin for you to actually produce that unit. And whatever that is, you got to go out and get it. And I would rather take less clients that you make a margin on. So for you self-employed people that are not business owners yet, you're operating as a, you know, in the business, it's sometimes better to stick to, this is the number that I want. And, you know, getting your gross margin and selling less. You will make more money than if you did double the business and lowered your price a little bit or did some type of a sale. I see that all the time, too. Like, I, I, honestly, you know, I don't own um, these types of businesses or haven't, but some businesses that do like a, a, and I'm sure that, you know, if there are bigger companies, they've done the marketing behind this. But what happens is you get small businesses that just follow it. I'm doing a Black Friday sale and everything is half off. Well, guess what? It's nice for the Black Friday, but then you got to perform for the rest of the year whatever you sold at half off if you're in the service business. So value yourself. It's very important that you value yourself. Listen, you're going to have to make hard decisions in business. So one, another book, which I'm going to tell you about, it's called 10X is easier than 2x. Actually, the guy that wrote Who Not How, which I spoke about in the last uh, podcast, uh, wrote this book as well. And this is not Grant Cardone. This is not like, hey, you know, let me tell you the, the Grant Cardone one first, which is not bad, which is like, you know, listen, if you want to do a million dollars in sales and you're doing 100,000, you know, you should, you should shoot for 10 million. And you know what? If you miss 10 million and you're at 6 million, you're still better than the million that you started with. So shoot high, and if you miss, you're still going to be high. That's the logic. This is not that. What this is, is really changing your mindset. And when you're a business owner, self-employed, you know, everything is about your mindset. So if you want to double your revenue, it's pretty simple. Just do double what you're doing. But the thing is, you're already working 60 hours, 70 hours a week. What are you going to do? Work 140 hours a week? And that's what some people do. And some people relate to, to be successful, you must do hard work. And everything must be hard. 
this is not accurate at all. In the book, 10x is easier than 2x. Basically says that if you want to 10x your revenue, you can't do the same thing. You have to think out of the box. You have to come up with novel ideas about how can you become, you know, you might have to restructure your whole business in order to get the 10x. And that's how you get 10x instead of doing 2x. Now, relating too hard, a lot of people feel guilty if they don't work hard, especially you're a business owner. You know, you started from, you know, scratch and you built the business and you worked hard and that's how you got where you were. What I will tell you is what has gotten you here will not get you here. You have to change what you're doing. It will, you will hit a ceiling and you need to take the ceiling and make it the floor. You have to change to get, you can go from zero to a million or, you know, 2 million a year, you know, in income, but working hard, but you can't make a hundred million a year working hard. You have to have a real business. You have to have a business that works for itself. You have to have a business that's earning you money when you're not working. So that's how I really relate it. Like, yeah, I can work hard and make $2 million a year, but I can't make $250 million a year working hard. It's not possible. You can't work yourself that far. And your business that you have now, you can't 250 times it to get to there. So stop relating to being successful as being a hard worker. You need to be a smart worker. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean I don't work hard. That doesn't mean you shouldn't work hard. But what it means is stop relying on the hard work. Look for the smart way to do it. If you're a hard worker, that means that you will always have a baseline. You know, you can never go, well, you could go to zero. You could go bankrupt. But if you're a hard worker, you'll be right back. You know, that's what that means. You can't look at it for the top line. Use it for the baseline. You know what? If everything goes to crap, I know that I can work hard enough that I can earn. But if you think that you can make $100 million or $50 million or whatever, working hard, you cannot. So don't relate to it like that. So I talked a little bit about the 80-20 rule. Here's another one. And I want to talk about things that are like near and dear to my heart as a business owner that, you know, a lot of people might not talk about. This one took me forever to learn. I was very quick to hire, but slow to fire. So what I mean by that is like, you know, my businesses would be expanding and, you know, somebody would say, listen, you know, your business is expanding. You got more revenue. You need to hire more people. And, you know, uh, so I would hire the more people because it made sense to me. Like, hey, I got more revenue. I need more help around here. But you know what? I didn't. I didn't create the position or I didn't really take the time to think about the position I was hiring them for and have them properly trained. Now, that was number one. But number two, the biggest part of this, you know, quick to hire, slow to fire is we all go through very ups and downs in business. Like, you know, if you are an employee, you know nothing about like, hey, one year you make two million and next year you make zero. You know, one year you make 200,000 and next year you make 50,000. That's dramatic. That's what it can be like in business. So, you know, when you have these drops, you know, you're like, well, you know, I don't want to, you know, I had Susie around for a long time. You know, I don't want to let her go. I don't know what Susie's going to do if I let her go. And what if, you know, right around the corner, you know, we get a big job and then I need Susie and this, that, and the other thing. Listen, I'm not saying that as soon as you see like some kind of financial turmoil that you let go of Susie, but we all know when it's time to let people go because the business is telling us it's time to let people go. And you start to really be a person and think like, what, am, what are they going to do? They'll figure it out. A matter of fact, I have had times in my life where I let people go probably two years too late. And you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars that I could have used. You know, I could have taken for myself personally or I could have used to expand the business you know, or, you know, fix the business, paid off debt, whatever it might be. But there's people I fired two years later and literally said to me, wow, I, I, I thought you, I would have been fired two years ago. Great job there. And I sat there and I said to myself, the whole time I'm sitting here thinking like, you know, they can't live without me. Yes, they can. They'll figure it out and you'll figure it out too. But you need to be, you know, slow to hire and quick to fire. That's the point of this. 
Do not hire people unless you are ready to hire people. The business can support it, and you actually have somebody that can train them, and they can actually be the who in your who, not how. You know, you want them to be the who. You want them to be better than you. You want to hire people that are better than you. And when your business justifies it, you should do that, and you should hire them. But be slow to hire them. But then when you have to fire them, be quick to fire them. Very important. This one, everybody knows, everybody hears it, but you know what? It doesn't really resonate until you're in business. Cash flow is king. So I can have a business, and the business could be making no money, but I could have tons of cash flow. Well, guess what? I'm not going to feel this is why it's important to have financial statements, because then you would know, hey, I'm not really making money, but I just have cash flow. And you could have cash flow. A lot of people don't understand accounting. So how could you have cash flow from a business that doesn't make money? Very simple. You have a business. You have no sales, right? Or let's say you have one sale. You collect the sale. It's $100,000. Well, with that, you have $40,000 in bills that you need to pay. Well, you don't pay them in the first month. You don't pay them in the second month. You put them on a 90-day schedule like the government does for some of my dear friends. Um, and so, you know, those first three months, you got 40000 40000 40000 You think you're doing good, but really, you have a $120,000 liability. If you don't have a balance sheet, you don't know that. Cash flow is king. That's actually good. Sometimes, in a good cash-flowing business, you know, your customers don't pay you. Like, here's an example, like the government. The government might not pay, or a big business, you know, might not pay you for 90, 120 days. Well, guess what? If you're paying all your vendors immediately, so you get no money in, pay a vendor. No money in, pay a vendor. Where are you going to get that money? Either you're going to dump money in yourself, or you're going to pay it from what existing cash that you have in the business. This is bad cash flow management. Like, if you have a million dollars in receivables, then you should have a million dollars in payables. Now, listen, if you can have a million in receivables and maybe your payables are, you know, you know, 200,000, yeah, you can pay them and wait for the money. But you don't want to be the guy, wait, you can go out of business waiting 120 days to get paid. And there are solutions for that. There are companies out there that will give you money based, it's called factoring based on your receivables, but it's super expensive. And I swear to God, I really think it's like doing a deal with the devil. So, you know, there's business out there. Hey, you got a million on the street and now you can't pay your payroll next week. Well, we'll give you 700,000 tomorrow, you know, uh, but when the payable comes in, we get a million. You know, I don't know if those are the numbers, but they're, it's very expensive money. So there are solutions to those things, but those solutions cost money. So cash flow is king. You should, when you start a business, you know, you should make sure that you have business capital, not just a line of credit against your house or personal lines of credit because businesses can go under and you can go bankrupt in business. And if you were to do that, you know, you don't want a lot of people take this, especially, you know, I haven't been talking too much in the last two podcasts about real estate, but in real estate, a lot of people take it for granted to give someone what's called a personal guarantee. Now, personal guarantee is basically saying, listen, if the business doesn't make it happen, then you can come after me. I can tell you from mentors of mine that I, you know, I noticed that were 20, 25 years ahead of me, they would make such a big deal about you know, going to the bank, getting a loan on a deal, and saying, listen, I'm not going to personally guarantee it. And I'm going, man, it sounds like you just don't want to pay the loan. And they're like, listen... If we get in a recession or this or that, I don't want to have that hanging over my head. If you personally guarantee it, the bank can not only go after your business or the asset, but they can come after you for the deficiency. So most of the times when you start down as a real estate investor, you will personally guarantee some stuff. But what I'm talking about is now we're running a business. There are businesses where you can borrow. Like if you want to borrow from the SBA, they will, you know, they'll, they'll ask for a personal guarantee. But you can get business credit that is based on the credit of your business that has nothing to do with you doing a personal guarantee and has nothing to do with your credit. It's not on your credit. You know, you want to get business credit that you can borrow money. And if the business can't pay it back, the business can't pay it back. And you won't forever be indebted or have to worry about a bankruptcy or anything like that. So cash flow is king. It's very important when you start the business that you have an idea, you get good financial statements, you go to the banks, you, bought, you get lines of credit at the bank because 
Let's say you're waiting for a receivable, but you still want to pay your payables. It's okay to tap the line and pay your payables because that, that was good debt that you put on there. You paid your vendors. The vendors are going to be happy. When that money comes in, you pay off your line. Don't not pay off your line. Don't collect all this money, think that you're rolling in the dough, and then have a, a million-dollar payable later, and you never paid off your line. You know, So these are things that can all be solved if you are looking at financial statements and making strategic decisions you know, informed decisions. So cash flow is king. You got to manage that cash flow. Here's another one. Let me start with partners. So I don't know if you have any partners and I've had partners all, uh, you know, through my life. And the first thing, if you're going to have partners, you know, you don't, you are never going to do the same amount of work as your partner. And they are never going to do the same amount of work. At some point, let's say there's two partners. At some point, one partner is going to be doing 70%. The other one's going to be doing 30 And this is something you have to accept and understand in the beginning. And, it, you know, don't – it can destroy partnerships that you're like, well, I'm doing all the work and this one's in la-la land, et cetera, et cetera. It's very important that you guys understand that and you have expectations. Sometimes I'm going to carry, sometimes you carry. Sometimes I'm going to carry. You want to go on a two-month vacation to Italy? You know, I'll carry. But you know what? When I come back and I want to go to, you know, uh, Hawaii, you know, you carry it. Whatever it might be, just be mindful. When you're partners, you will never do the same amount of work, and it can cause some kind of rift uh, in the relationship. The other thing is, Try to have a partner that has assets that you don't have. Now, I don't mean like like actual assets. I mean like a skill set. So, you know, if if I'm good with numbers, I want a guy that's a good salesperson. You know, you don't want partners that all are very – one guy's good with technology, the other guy's not. Like you don't want to have all the same skill sets because then really what are your partners for? Maybe because you, you, you share it in the investment in the capital. You know, try to get a partner that brings something to the game that you don't have. And, and bring a smart partner that's dedicated, you know, uh, dedicated to you. So partners, be, you know, be mindful. Like if you're, you know, have a big company and, you know, one person's in charge of the finances and that person's writing all the checks. Listen, you know, if it, the wire is over $10,000, maybe two people have to sign on that check. You know, I've seen many, many, many times. Uh, where people, you know, one person's in control of the money and that person's taking more money than the other people and you don't know until it's too late and they run, because you're not looking at financials, they run the business into, you know, oblivion. So partners, be very careful with partners. I'm not saying that the partners can't be great. I've had great relationships with partners and I've had terrible relationships with partners. Um, it, it, you know, it all depends, but I've learned over the years, you know, what to look for, what you don't want to do and what kind of partners you want to have. Here's another one that I think is like super duper important. Don't kill the golden goose. Now, I think this is a fairy tale back in the day. I heard like there was like a golden goose and it laid these golden eggs and blah, 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 blah. Your business is the golden goose. So, you know, what happens when you become successful? So, you know, a lot of what I've been talking about is like hard, you know, what if things are not good? But listen, we, we all have great times in business and hopefully all you have had is tons and tons of success. Well, some people that have early success or some success, they get distracted. And what I mean by that is as soon as you start making money and everybody knows, that's another one I'll talk about, you know, uh, guess what? all these magical opportunities are going to come to you, you know? And hey, you know, I remember, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I hate to say, but you know, I didn't come from money. And when I first started making millions of dollars, you know, people used to set up meetings with me all the time. And I would, you know, I also would educate myself. I'd be like, okay, I'm me with that guy and this guy and this guy. And, and you know what? You know, I was like, wow, you know, it must be nice to be rich. Everybody brings you all these wonderful opportunities, but they're not opportunities. These are other people that need you and, you know, don't get distracted and forget about your golden goose. What could happen is now, you know, the reason your company is doing so well is because you're focused on your company and your energies in your company. And listen, if you're doing well, 
make sure you focus on that business. Don't get distracted with all these little shiny objects and, hey, I'm, you know, even let's say real estate. Like, don't start buying real estate if your business isn't healthy, you know, and don't take 80% of your time and not focus on your business. Your business is the golden goose. Your business is giving you cash flow every day. I don't care what real estate, you know, it's easy to park some money into real estate and buy some property. You don't have to spend that much time doing it. So, Whatever those opportunities that come up, you know, maybe it's your friends that you grew up with and maybe it's, you know, some guy, it, it, listen, there's some really good people, salesmen out there and trust me that they can sound enticing. It's all distraction. If you've got a golden goose and you got a business that's making money, focus on that and don't get distracted by all these, you know, you know, shiny objects, basically. So it's very important that, you know, you stay focused on your business. And with that business, what you want to do is you want that business to generate income and you want it to, you do want to invest in other assets. Real estate's, real estate's a great asset and you want your money to make babies. You want your money to make baby money, you know? But if you have to spend 80% of your time over here, you will lose that golden goose. Do not lose that golden goose. Um, the other thing is maybe you don't want to hire friends. You know, I would love to say that um, I would love to say that differently, but I can tell you over my career, hiring friends, you know, you should hire the most qualified person for the job. And sometimes when you hire friends, maybe they're good, maybe they're not, but you also have that friend relationship. I don't know if, if you're a, you know, if you're a child and, and you know, like friends, you know, um, and I hope my mom doesn't watch this podcast. You know, I'm a pretty successful guy, right? To this day, my mother has never said she's proud of me. Now, I'm not going to go and cry about that. But, you know, to your friends, you're always their friend. You might be Bill Gates, but you're always their friend. You're the guy from the neighborhood. And, you know, and listen, there's going to be a little bit of jealousy behind them, et cetera, et cetera. So watch your back. I wouldn't recommend hiring friends. It's never, I'm trying to think. It's really never worked out for me. Get the most qualified person. Now, the other thing is, I got great advice one time from one of my partners. And I used to find a Christmas time. And in the United States, you know, uh, Christmas is a big deal, obviously. And <laughs> you could be Muslim, you could be Jewish, but you still expect a Christmas bonus in the United States, right? And people would, friends of mine I grew up with, you know, employees, they would come to me. And at, at the time, I had two other partners. And they would come to me and they would say, hey, man, you know, uh, I don't have any money for my family this Christmas. And, you know, can I borrow four thousand dollars? And I used to say to myself, like, hold on a minute. You just told me you don't have money. You're going to borrow money to give it to somebody else. How crazy is that? And listen, I had a very. Um, I, I know what that's like. You know, it's a big deal in the U.S. with the Christmas. And and I had a year where I went bankrupt and I literally wrote on a piece of paper IOUs to my mom, my sister. It, I mean, it was, to this day, it was, it was dramatic. But I wasn't going to borrow money to give them. That's insane. But the point of this story was, this happened to me every year. And I can't tell you, you know, I'm like, hey, I'm making money. Sometimes when you're making money, you just feel guilty. You shouldn't feel guilty. You put in the effort. You took the risk. You know what? Those people that are taking money from you, even employees, like when I, when I speak about, you know, hey, you want to be, slow to hire and quick to fire. You know, I have a hard time firing people. I'm, you know, it, it's like, you know, it affects their family. But listen, when you hire somebody, you're paying them to do a job and they're not doing a the job, they are stealing from your family. That's the truth. They are, when I had kids, I would be like, oh my, it's like they're stealing from my children's college fund, which I don't know that we'll even do anymore because the price is so crazy. So, one of my partners said to me, the reason they come to you, Jay, is because they know that you're making money. I spend all year complaining, faking it, about, oh, I don't have money, oh, this, you know, I'm having a hard time with this, you know. And if you're rolling around in a new car and you're telling everybody how wonderful things are and the life is this and that, and it, you know, the first time I made a ton of money before my bankruptcy, you know, I let everybody know. Now, I don't, you know, if you let everybody know that you're making money, guess what? You're going to have a lot of evil eye looking at you and everybody's going to be shooting at you. 
that is not a good recipe. Hey, you should be proud of yourself, you know, but stay quiet, stay modest. You know, on my second go around, I wasn't showing off anything to anybody. You know, people would be like, oh man, how do you, how, I didn't even know that you did this. Yeah, I didn't want you to know that I was doing this. So what I learned from this partner, which my advice to you is listen, don't make it so obvious that you're making money. And even if you are making money, complain about your payables, man, I haven't, or your receivables. I haven't received, you know, man, it looks like, you know, we haven't gotten any receivables from this. You know, you don't want to make it look like you're flush because if you're flush, everybody's coming to the bank of you. And it's really good advice. I wish I would have learned it better. Um, all right. So let me talk a, one more subject, which is, let's say you get yourself in a jam. You know, uh, you get yourself in a jam. The business is not doing well. You got a lender. Here's, here's what happens to a lot of people. Maybe you got a lender. I'll give you a real story, which I just shared with somebody yesterday, one of my students yesterday. And I was, you know, a little embarrassed to share it. And then after I shared it, I said, you know what? That's a real story. And it resonates. So I had a business and we were paying to a lender. And, and I think I had talked to you about like, you know, selling your receivables. We were selling our receivables, paying this, this, that, and the other thing. Anyway, we were paying 200,000, I know this is insane, 200,000 per week to this lender. And, you know, we probably, we would, you know, pay them down, borrow again, pay them down, borrow again. And, you know, it was this vicious cycle. Well, I, probably a year ahead, a year previous, I was like, this is not, this is not going to end well. Like, we're not going to be able to continue to pay them. But, you know, we sold more and we did this and we worked harder and we were just working for this lender, right? So, but this lender had us all jacked up. And this is why I'm telling you guys too, like, you don't want to personally guarantee stuff. You personally guarantee it. You're not like, okay, well, listen, we don't pay the lender. They can take the business and come after our house. All these assets we worked for. Be careful. Personal guarantees can wipe you out. So honestly, it got to a point. I probably knew we had a year ahead of time. It got to a point where it was like, you know, listen, we're not going to last 30 days if we don't do something about this loan. What are we going to do? So one of my partners went to one of his mentors. Actually, no, we didn't. We came up with this great way of how um, we could get somebody else to pay off this lender and they would make a nice return, et cetera, et cetera. Another piece of advice. You can never borrow money, and nobody will give you money when you need money. Never, ever, ever will you get it. People know when you are down, and they're ner it's not that they're being mean. It's like, hey, you know, I see the end for you. I don't want to give you money and be at the end with you. Now, when things are flying high, people are throwing money all over the place, you know, but when it's down and they, people know, you know, then, you know, hey, you're paying your payables later. You know, maybe you were, you know, you were paying every week. Now you're paying them two months later. People know. So anyway, we went to this mentor of one of my partners and said, listen, we got this great deal. And this guy had a ton of money. He could have totally done this deal. And he was like, listen, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to do the deal. And he said, you know, but we had to disclose what the situation was. And he said, listen, you should just go back to this lender and renegotiate the deal. And we're like, what do you mean renegotiate the deal? The guy's got personal guarantee of this, of that, this, that, and the other thing. And um, he said, yeah, but he's a lender. If you guys go under, he's got nothing, right? And as this guy was also a lender, and I am a lender now too, and I can tell you that the biggest, scariest thing for a lender is when you can't pay at all. You lo they lose the assets. It's not like a house. So like you have a house, somebody, a bank loans you on a house, it's $400,000. Worst could happen is it goes down in value in a recession or something like this. But if you loan me $400,000 to my business and I go out of business, that $400,000 could be zero. So I had a hard time, you know, a hard time with that. I had an ego. I'm scared. And I basically went, um, we consulted with three different bankruptcy attorneys and basically, I, I set up the meeting with the lender, and I knew, um, I, I, I knew, you know, look, if the, if the lender said no to, we came up with a strategy where, listen, we can't pay this loan off in a year. We'll pay it off in five years at this interest rate, and we'll be able to pay it off, and the business will be fine, 
and blah, 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 blah. But if this guy said no, we were done. So we needed to talk to some bankruptcy attorneys so that, you know, they couldn't just swipe in and take all the assets and, you know, people would be out of jobs and et cetera, et cetera. So I went into this meeting and not only did I need to renegotiate the deal, it was like a Wednesday. We didn't have money for payroll on Friday. So I needed to borrow $200,000 too, which is insane. So I had, I walked into this guy's office and, you know, I said, listen, uh, we can't pay. Look, we've been a good pay for you for three years and it's just, it's been killing us. You know, we're a good business. The business makes cash flow, but you're just taking too much too fast. We can pay you over the next five years. This is the plan. And oh, by the way, I can't make payroll on Friday. I need to borrow 200000 which you can add to this loan. But if you don't lend me this $200,000, you know, we're all done. And we're filing for bankruptcy. I already met with three bankruptcy attorneys and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, crazy, right? You tell somebody you can't pay them. This is the terms at which I can pay you. And you got to lend me more money. The guy was pissed, man. To this day, and I had never told this story to anybody but my partners that were in the room, and they were like, I can't believe you were even. They said, let's renegotiate the deal. We'll figure out the payroll. Don't ask for the payroll. I was like, we got to ask for the payroll, right? Well, anyway, the guy gave the deal because he couldn't lose the asset. He agreed to the deal. He lent us the $200,000, and we were fine. We avoided a bankruptcy. We were this close to a bankruptcy, you know? And I realized... You know, like I said here in this meeting that, you know, when you're a business owner, I had never told that story. I haven't even told that story to my mother or my wife, that story, you know, because I, you can't tell those. I didn't tell my employees. And I had only told that story to, because it served one of my students yesterday. And I couldn't believe that years later, I never shared this story. So I'm now sharing it with you guys. I'm actually proud of myself because I think somebody, just one person might take some value from that. And the value I want to take from that is be creative. You know, I also, you know, uh, I also heard a story or I watched it where Donald Trump in the 80s did the same kind of thing. And what I had learned is a lot of successful business people, when you got to renegotiate, remember, what are they, what are they got? No asset. Now, uh, uh, the student that I had, he had borrowed money. He uh, is having a, a difficult time financially. He had borrowed money, no personal guarantee, uh, 240000 And his ego, he had a meeting with this lender, and he said, listen, I wasn't able to pay you. I'll pay you 340 and I'll start paying you money. And I said, listen, this guy has no asset. He, I respect, hey, you borrowed money from the guy, you should pay the guy back. But do it on your terms. I'm not saying, hey, you shouldn't pay the guy. That's not what I'm saying here. But what I'm saying is do it on terms that you know that you can make happen that don't hurt you and don't shackle you. So I guess the moral of this story is, you know, the answer is always no until you ask. And in business, there's a lot of things you can ask for that you don't even know you can ask for that everybody that's been around the block would sit there and go, well, you know, I would have went out of business. I would have went out of business if I didn't get that advice from my partner's mentor to just go renegotiate and explain to me how that loan was an asset. So I guess the moral story is the answer is always no until you ask. You're going to have to make some hard decisions. Business is hard. Business is hard. Find someone you can really talk to that you can, that trusts you, that you can trust, that knows what you're going through and isn't judging you because we all need help. We all need help through our endeavors in business. So on that crazy story that I didn't think I would ever tell anybody, I'm going to, you know, finish this episode. I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode. Whew. Thank you for watching Real Estate Doctor Podcast. Have the best day of your life. Thanks, guys. Go there.